Um, so I'm super excited to hear uh, what Jimmy has to tell us here. He is a senior research associate at Georgia Health Policy Center, uh, and he's been working to improve public health uh, by advancing the high app perspective of decision making. And uh, he has expertise in the areas of system thinking, health impact assessment, and healthy community design, and also some particular expertise in the area of maternal and child health projects that he's been leading and also uh, with the provision of training and technical assistance to local, state, and national partners related to HIAP. So uh, without further ado, I'm really excited to hear what you have to share with us here, Jimmy. All right. All right, thanks. Oh, it's bright up here. All right, thanks, everybody. Um, I am Jimmy Dills, James, if you're nasty. Um, and I'm here to, under the banner of decision support tools. And that's very broad and fiercely taking notes from what Julia was saying, and bear with me as I try to adapt and touch on what she's saying, and I only have 25 minutes. Um, but really thinking about two key decision support, and what we titled this is sort of building room for possibilities, and possibilities for collaborations by advancing a health and all policies mindset. Julia talked a little bit about, you know, HIAP's an approach, not like one specific thing, and some of that ambiguity makes it hard to implement. And so one of the first tools I'm going to talk through is this iceberg model from systems thinking that's really a great way to start, start piecing out that complexity and getting to what are the mindsets that are driving the way the system works and how can you unpack and untangle those. Um, and those kind of conversations, while they not, might not seem like direct, you know, here's a decision and it's going to affect this and do this kind of support tools, but it's part of that broader collaboration and moving towards this health and all policies mindset. And Touching on, you know, you don't even have to call it health and all policies. It can be quality of life, wellness, well-being, economic prosperity. All those things are health and all policies. And often when you're working across sectors from public health, it's a, little, it's a little painful for us to sort of give up on some of our language and use the language of the field that we're collaborating with. Um, so that's the perspective I'm bringing on one tool. And then I'll talk about health impact assessment, which can anybody, if I can even see, show of hands, who's heard of health impact assessment or been involved in any? OK, so a good amount. Um, and it's an established tool for health and all policies. It's been around internationally for several decades in the US for about 20 years. It was some of the seminal work that um, led to uh, what Julia was talking about with California, a lot of the early work out there. We did some work here a decade ago in Nashville, um, or over a decade now when I was here. And that really, that's why I'm excited to be back here and talking about this to see, I was sitting there thinking and it's like, I don't think I had a part in really planting the seeds because a lot of this stuff was already going and happening over 10 years ago when I first came here. And so I think maybe some of the work we did with the health department back then under communities put, putting prevention to work started to expand this conversation and maybe help nurture those seeds to now see what's happening 10 years later and that there's a large group like this coming from inside and outside government to talk about health and all policies. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit of introduction to myself. Um, talk about health and all policies as a systems approach, then uh, go into health impact assessment, try not to get too down in the weeds of that, but really sharing that as an, a big, uh, wide encompassing tool that you can pull different pieces out of, um, share a little bit of our story of how we used HIA to move to a high at mindset, particularly around affordable housing practice and policy, um, mostly in Georgia, but had some, um, have also done that work nationally as well. Um, and then share a list, and I assume we're getting all these slides out to you all, and so I have several slides at the end with links to additional lists, including that um, health note analysis and health lens and high C checklist and a lot of these other sort of more immediate tools that you can use, but I really lean on health impact assessment as the one that can really create the structured space for these cross-sector collaborations to really bear fruit over the long term. Um, and then hopefully have time for Q&A, but we'll see where it goes. So, Again, I'm Jimmy Dills. I'm from the Georgia Health Policy Center at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies in Georgia State University. And land, I will say, model the land acknowledgement. So I'm coming from um, land stolen from the Muscogee Creek people that's now called Atlanta, Georgia. And we do, I'm going to skip over too much of my introduction, but I was asked to share a little bit about the Policy Center. And so Julia comes from the Public Health Institute in California. GHPC is our shorthand. We are a public health institute and the Public Health Institute for Georgia, and we're part of a network with Julia's organization and others across the country that forms the National Network of Public Health Institutes. 
I believe Tennessee has had one and maybe has a new one starting again. I'm not sure. Um, but that's, that's so Julia's is sort of outside of government. We are housed in a university that's a public university, so we are quasi kind of state employees. Um, and so that affects the way we approach our work. And you can see our mission there to integrate research policy and practice. And that's what really drove me to this position um, at GHPC. And this type of work with health impact assessment, health and all policies is it gets past just researching these issues and having findings that get published. And yes, we know disparities are bad and we know they're driven by inequities. And so that's the end of it. This is the space, health and all policies, and this is the, the translational work that makes that real does something with that information in terms of changing policy, changing practices, moving us forward as you know, local communities, state communities, national communities, even internationally. And you can see our values up there. And again, there's a link here. There's a really nice little five minute video about our 20 plus year history and all the different things we've done in Georgia and nationally. So we do have a national footprint. But thinking about values and values might, are somewhat synonymous with mindsets. And so I want to touch on continuous learning uh, the relationship aspect, um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And sort of those are really align with the values of health impact assessment, health and all policies work. And it's about learning over time and how do collaborations happen and building those from institutional relationships as well as personal, genuine, individual relationships. And those networks are what make health and all policies successful over time. And Julia got at that of the long amount of time that California's been doing this for 20 years and has just now moved into the equity kind of language or the branding of it versus just health and all policies. It's now the equity aspect. And that takes time. And in California, as a large state, that takes a lot of time. In Georgia, one of the stories I'll tell about the affordable housing, that's been a 10 plus year journey to really move these things along. And so the question earlier about the, the urgency of this, I think that's really there. And it's figuring out how to address that immediate urgency leverage that attention to address some of the deeper seated systemic challenges that really are going to take a long time to solve because it took us a long time to get here and it takes a long time and a lot of collaboration to get out of those things um, out of these challenges that have been created so health and all policies as a systems approach how many folks here have done sort of systems thinking work or would consider yourself systems thinkers a couple in the back a few okay um so Julie shared one definition. Wait, I'm going to go back and make sure I'm saying the things I wanted to say. Because she gave me so many good ideas. Uh, da, 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 da. So she shared that definition of inequity from um, Virginia Department of Public Health that talked about disparities are systemic. And I think that's why I gravitate towards this definition of health and all policies, as it's not about necessarily changing one specific decision. It's about changing the systems that create the decisions. And so getting that further upstream and thinking more deeply about how do you build trust over time to help have those people help you work upstream to do the different things and thinking about different perspectives that are involved in systems. And a foundational part of systems thinking work is this idea of perspectives. You may have seen different versions of this sort of cartoon, but basically valuing different perspectives. One person sees the blue circle. The other person from where they're standing, they see the red rectangle. And that creates our mental models of how that problem in the center, what's working, how is that happening? How, how do we view that is really based on our perspective. And it's only when we use these type of tools to create safe spaces for trust building conversations, sharing our mental models, that's how we can build the more complete understanding of the challenges, identify those different solutions, and potentially help move some of the mindsets to acknowledge that all those different perspectives are valid and valuable and some maybe more so than others in different perspectives. But really, I want you to think as you, as you hear this and maybe reflect on what Julia said and what you'll hear from the panel later are, what are these perspectives? This is a perspective I bring to this type of work. I'm excited to hear the type of perspectives you all bring to this work. Julia shared her perspectives from California. And so really just thinking, acknowledging that aspect that we all have our own valuable perspectives from our own lifetime of experience. And some people, that's the lived experience of the challenges we're trying to solve on the ground in communities. Others of us that lived experience is working in the details of those policies and that nuance and all that, that minutia. And when you have those working together, that's how you can translate some of those personal lived experience stories into actual policy solutions because you're working together based on that, that broader, deeper understanding of the challenge. Um, another thing from systems, try to make it interactive. So another show of hands, who's seen sort of the iceberg metaphor, iceberg model of, of complex challenges? So, um, 
Julie mentioned the sort of wicked problems, and that's synonymous with the complex challenges and complexity in the world. And this tool, this is a tool, an adaptation of this, and in the, in the slides there's links to facilitation guides and things like that, but basically it's a simple sort of four-tiered structure, and I'll walk through one as an example, um, and then encourage you as we t think about this, I wanna hear from you sort of what, what are some of the mindsets you think need to shift to do your work better? And so, starting at the tip of the iceberg with the events, these are the things we see, this is what you're reacting to, and so the example I'll use to illustrate this is the traffic jam. We get traffic congestion, that's the event people see, react to, that's what's out there, but that event exists in a context of outcome. Why, is it, why does it matter that we're sitting stuck in traffic for so long? It's because it affects economic productivity. It can affect your quality of life. It can affect, from a public health standpoint, mor morbidity, mortality. All these things can be sort of knock-ons of that event of traffic congestion. So if you're focusing on traffic congestion as the complex problem that you're trying to solve, you know, and you're just looking at that, you can react to that. You can sort of, you're, you're dealing with the symptoms of the problem, but it takes going deeper under the surface of the iceberg to get down to this next tier of the behaviors. Well, what's driving that event? What are the patterns of behavior that lead to people having to sit in their cars on the highway every day as they sit in traffic? And, one, and there's personal individual kind of people behaviors that are part of systems, as well as the behaviors of the systems themselves. And what is the system doing? How is it behaving and what are the patterns? So here we have simple, the pe people drive to work. If everybody's driving to work, then there's gonna be more cars on the road that can lead to traffic congestion. From the system behavior standpoint, we're building more highways. So the more lanes you build of road, the more space there are for cars, the more people are gonna drive their cars, the more likely you are to end up with more traffic congestion. And so that behavior of our transportation infrastructure systems really building more roads is based on a deeper seated structure that sets the context for that, and in this case, it's because we have this exist existing road network. The environment's already tuned and primed for roadway travel. And so the system just naturally moves towards building more roads because that's what we have. We'll add to that and we'll just keep dealing with that. On the human side, the structures can be sort of more of the policies, the environments, the relationships between those things. And here we're thinking about, especially during the pandemic, working from home, the remote work policies at any given employer, that impacts the likelihood of people doing that behavior of driving to work. And then that again feeds up into that event you're seeing. But you can see already we're getting down lower and lower into the, the weeds of this problem. And so how do we think about remote work policies? How do we think about highway infrastructure and, and how, we're, how our environments are designed, how our policies are, are working for or against the behavior patterns we wanna see to affect the events we're seeing in the outcome. But then, Below that are these mindsets, and those are the beliefs, the values, the, the biases, the things that, that lead to our mental models of how the system is working. And that kind of thinking at that level, that's what sets the context for the type of structures you're gonna be able to have. That's gonna set the context for behaviors and so forth. And so here, employers, others might have a mindset that remote work is just not as productive. And so if you have that mindset, you're gonna set workplace policies that don't allow for remote work, you're gonna have more people driving, et cetera. I think that's a space where we've really seen a lot of mindset shift over the last few years, that you can be productive from home. Maybe we don't need to have everybody come into the office every single day. So that's a mindset shift that is changing the way workplace policies deal with transportation. On the other side, just sort of this common mindset that everybody can drive, everybody wants to drive, that's the best way to do it, and so that's how we're gonna just keep building roads for people to drive on. And that mindset can be questioned. Maybe not everybody wants to drive. Certainly not everybody can drive. There are people who need to engage and interact in society in a place that can't drive to work. So if we're not thinking about solutions for them as part of that mindset that builds the context, you're not gonna get those patterns of behavior that can actually reduce the event that you're seeing in terms of traffic congestion. So there it all is in one space. Um, and the last piece of this is really thinking about this leveraging opportunity. And again, you can react to the events, and often you need to. There are things that you have to react to and deal with. And traffic congestion, you know, that's where you get the, the he I don't know what they're called here, but we have the hero trucks in Georgia where they come out and deal with the thing, move the accident to the side so the traffic can keep moving. That's reacting. But then when you're thinking about those patterns of behavior, everybody's driving to work, well, we're gonna hypo make hypotheses around what we predict there in terms of behavior, we can think, differently about the problem and come up with solutions that anticipate some of the issues. Getting further down into the structural level where the policies exist, 
that's where you're really thinking about designing the structures, designing the context in a way that lead to those behaviors and the, and the improved events. And then again, the highest leverage is down at the bottom in the mindset level. If you can transform people's mindsets around a challenge, that's how you can really start to identify broader and more impactful solutions that are sustainable over the long term. Um, and so, let's see, where am I here? Mindset, so a couple of mindset things that I was thinking about and Julia echoed in my mind is this idea just simply from moving from thinking about health as health care to a mindset of a healthy community. Just that change in mindset opens up a whole wide range of opportunities to create structures. Um, you can think about, she talked about policy, and especially for those of us in government roles, we can't lobby, and it becomes very scary when we're helping trying to people to think about policy solutions, but all they hear is policy that's lobbying, we're a state agency, we can't do that. So shifting from this policy advocacy mindset to a more inclusive policy engagement mindset, just that little shift of, you can still engage in policy in those big P, those little P policies, there's a lot of space for policy engagement that's not advocating for particular legislation or doing lobbying. And just that, that mindset shift opens up the conversation for broader collaboration around these. Um, let's see, mindset, iceberg. Oh, and she talked about um, structures a little bit. Um, let's see, what was she, she was talking about the, oh, the community participation aspect and some of the like, you know, I had not heard that before, that they can't pay community-based organizations until the work is done, that kind of stuff. Those are the minutia of structures that you could change, that a government agency can work to change some of those structures to lead to better patterns of community participation, can lead to more community involvement in policy, but that takes a mindset that values that and realizes we need them, communities need to lead this work. This needs to be centered in the community experience. Once you have that mindset, then you can start to talk about changing those structures to actually support the, the engagement of communities in the way she was discussing. So I'm gonna pause there um, briefly and ask for you all to just popcorn if you, if you feel comfortable to do so, with your work in health and health policies, what's kind of a what's a mindset shift you would like to see or have seen in some of your work? Anybody? Anybody? Yes, in the corner. Speak up for us, please. Right. So police are needed. So the sort of first mindset is police are public safety, and we catch crooks, and we do that kind of stuff. But shifting the mindset around policing to it's about well-being. It's engaging in the mental health aspect of this. There's a deeper seated issue that's not just crime control. It's about working with people and their perspectives. And once you have that shift in mindset of policing, that can open up a lot of different avenues for different programs. Anybody have another one? Yes. Yeah, so that's, I love that example because was, that was one I cut because I was like, I don't have enough time. But as she was talking about normalizing this, that normalizing, that's a mindset shift. Once you sort of see it and you normalize it and we do equity, inclusion, justice, diversity, those are our core values that we build on, then you can have the more impactful conversations. But again, that's easier said than done and we know to normalize that takes work. And so another part of systems thinking that's not really reflected here are the feedback loops that happen as you see changes in events and outcomes, and as you have more collaboration around behaviors and practices and structures, that can slowly lead to changes in mindset. And so that's, that's one decision support tool. That's how you can support more collaboration to get more informed decisions by having these type of conversations with different people. And I encourage you as you go into um, the breakout rooms, unfortunately I got another commitment, I'm not gonna get to see the panel, but once I started using this iceberg, years ago, I hear that and see that everywhere. And it's just, it's a really helpful sort of quick thing to just jot down and organize the complexity of what you're hearing. Like, well, what's the event we're talking about? Okay, what's, what's really the behavior driving that? What are the structures? Where can we intervene? What's the mindset that needs to shift to help us do this better? And that's an easy way to view problems and the challenges you're talking about. So I hope maybe this, this sticks with you through the rest of the day and you maybe jot down your own little icebergs of some of the issues you're hearing and the, the things you're seeing. But one way we can increase that leverage is, again, developing this health in all policies mindset. How do you get under the iceberg? Um, here we have 
seven strategies from uh, Asto Nacho. I think this one's specifically from Nacho. Um, and I put those up because a lot of decision support tools will do different aspects of these, but they're all important. And they don't necessarily have to happen in sequence, but when they're all happening, when all these strategies are aligned, that's where you can really start to see change again over time. And I put that there to tee up health impact assessment is one specific decision support tool and approach that really encompasses all those strategies of aligning measurement, aligning communication, integrating health, building capacity for others to think in a different way about their problems. Um, also, we just wrapped up last month an update to the minimum elements and practice standards of health impact assessment, um, which I was a part of the group that did this, and it was a, a long journey for us to do it. We really updated the standards for this approach to evolve and be more accommodating of wider breadth of practice. And it really came originally out of a sort of environmental impact assessment, a very rigorous science-based, and it's still based in science. But as the practice has evolved, we know we need to figure out how to get more qualitative data, those, that storytelling aspect. How do you bring that into these decision-making frameworks and these decision-making conversations? Um, let's see. And perspectives. I missed one about perspectives. I'll go back to that right now. Um, think about those different perspectives, and she used the river and the upstream version, and I really like that she built on that, and, and there's so many ways you can use that. It's a pretty simple parable that can be really powerful to help people think about how these things are, are sequenced in space, and just from those perspective standpoints, we're doing some work with um, federal stakeholders around health and um, healthy aging and affordable housing, and it was a real like light bulb moment when the partners from the housing side sort of spoke up on the call with the people from the health side and said, well, wait, you guys are talking about upstream, downstream. We know what that means. But I'm really getting the sense that your upstream is our downstream. And that really clicked for the people that were a part of that conversation to just really briefly in a simple statement understand, oh, we're public health and we're working way upstream in our standpoint. But the people coming from the federal housing side were like, well, that's once you get the things built and they're out in the world, that's way downstream from what we do. Our upstream is how do you organize the capital? How do you get all the things, all the financing involved? How do you do designs? And there's, there's so much further upstream, I feel like, for public health. We feel like we've gotten upstream when we're collaborating with those folks. But once you start to understand their perspective on the challenge, then you can start to really see how deep that goes and how much expertise comes into that housing conversation. Um, again, sort of. Focusing on values as part of mindset, and you can see those align with some of the values of my organization, some of the values and the issues that Julia was talking about, um, and the definition there, but really HIA is meant to, well, actually, I'll just go right into the minimum elements. There's a lot of words up there, again, hoping that you guys have this to reference later, and we'll check out the practice standards document. But these 10 things are the things that make HIA a little different from the other tools. When, it's, when all these things are going together, that's when you're really doing HIA. And first, it's a prospective approach. It's looking at decisions that are under consideration and influencing an existing decision-making time, uh, decision-making point. And thinking about you know, health and all policies as a mindset, as a systemic approach, that's looking at that whole system of decision-making. So within that, HIA is nested because HIA focuses on a specific decision and can bring together the stakeholders to inform that decision. And that's a piece we sort of changed is to be considered an HIA by what the practitioner society defines it and somewhat arbitrary, but we're, we're experts in this and this is what we think now, that rapid, intermediate, comprehensive, there's different scales of HIA, all of those need to engage stakeholders in some way. People who are either affected by the change, the decision you're looking at, the people who are making those decisions, but it can't just be you as a health person making some notes and some ideas. That used to be called desktop HIA, and now we're trying to move away from that language so that HIA, a core, a minimum element of HIA is engaging stakeholders that are affected by the decision. Um, it systemically considers a range of health impacts, so you rarely do an HIA on like one specific, we're just gonna look at injury here, but rather you talk with the community, you talk with those stakeholders and expand that and talk about not just the injury rates, but what are the behavior rates behind that? How does that affect obesity? How does that affect job opportunities and economic development? But really having this broad perspective of what impacts can be to again, make those conversations more inclusive of the people who need to hear them, who need to be a part of adjusting and working with those decision-making um, spaces. Uh, it characterized, wait, let's see, where am I? Uh, so then this is some of the, like the nuts and bolts of it. You've got to provide a baseline. Um, 
look at you know how what are the conditions now, but that's not just health conditions. That's some of the historical conditions, and I like that um, Julia raised that as part of their work with racial justice, and there's so much history and so much painful history there, and you gotta find the space to be able to include that, and that's in HIA, part of the baseline. Why are we here today? What are the historical implications of, of how we got here, and what can we learn from that to go forward? And sometimes it takes time with relationships to build the trust to have those challenging conversations in a way that is not, um, necessarily exp expressing blame or rehashing past grievance. It's really looking at those past experiences and making sure we don't have them again. And how do you pivot from that to something forward looking, which then is the next part where the HIA analysis actually very is focused on what are the potential health impacts of the decision? And then a real key piece is developing recommendations based on what you find there to actually influence that decision and target that decision with evidence-based predictions of potentially where health can, health can be impacted positively or negatively and you wanna enhance the positive, mitigate the negative, and that really creates a space where if you're doing it well and doing that inclusive engagement aspect of it, people will see themselves in these decisions and see how this recommendation came from the story we heard from that community member combined with this piece of data that led us to be able to make this recommendation that we think will make this project that much better because of it. And so when you're stringing all that together, to the recommendation aspect, that's what HIA gets you more, a little more so. And I don't want to diminish the value of the other tools that are a little simpler, because I know there's value in simple tools as well. But a lot of those are just sort of checklist and like health saying, here's some information, use it. Here's how we think we could use it. HIA makes that, here's our health information. Where's your information coming from? Let's put those together. Let's collaboratively interpret that and turn that into something useful for the decision. And through building those relationships, again, that's how you can sustain longer health and all policies work by building collaborations through tools like health impact assessment. Um, and finally, the back end stuff, it produces a report. It's really good if it's publicly available. At the very minimum, you want the decision makers to see it and the affected communities. Um, and then this is something we really softened in this version of the, the update is evaluating it. it. So many HIAs got funded through the years, but not funded for follow-up. And so a given HIA, the minimum element is just to propose ideas for how can you, who, who can continue to be involved in these decisions? Who can track how these decisions were implemented? Who can track how HIA recommendations might have been um, integrated into what's happening? And that requires sustained involvement of different perspectives. Um, and then finally, proposing the um, indicators things to, to measure the health outcomes, to sort of test those assumptions, see if things are improving. Um, I read an article or saw something recently, it wasn't from an HIA, but it was a really interesting article from Texas about the, the highway um, signs. We've had 3,000 road deaths on Texas roads this year. And they've, you know, those are supposed to be a self safety improvement thing. You're supposed to see that and say, oh my gosh, I need to drive more safely and I'm gonna do that. Well, they were able to do, design a study to show that actually injuries increase after that because that distracts drivers. That powerful message messes with your psyche enough that there was, I forget, it led to like 16 more deaths in Texas over the course of a year or something like that. But they were able to tease out that effect that this nudge for healthier driving behavior actually was counterintuitive. And they would not have known that if somebody had not been following that and testing that assumption that, you know, it's made in good intention. Let's show how dangerous roads are and that might make people drive more safely. Turns out that's not the place to do that. Um, and so an HIA, sorry, I totally went on a tangent there, but the HIA thinks about that. Who can track that? Who's gonna track the injuries over time? And that's where it can integrate with um, public sector, public health surveillance and the issues that you know people are already tracking data on, community health needs assessments, those types of things can be the place where you might be able to see long-term changes in health outcomes based on what an HIA does. Um, very quickly, just trying to illustrate this is our journey from HIA to HIAP and affordable housing in um, mainly in Georgia. Um, but I'll put this up first and ask, I'll ask everybody, but particularly people coming from a public health perspective, look at this figure, what's something you notice here maybe? It might make it different from other figures you see that are similar. Overlap, so a lot of the things are overlapping. Yep, what else? Oh man, I want to get you a gold star. I need to see who you are because you're saying all the right things. Exactly. So much of our work in health 
and it's not, not necessarily a bad thing. We're working in health. So health is the center for us and the public health side. Our perspective is everything flows from health, and health is the core thing. But if you take that message out to people who are working in housing and affordable housing and are passionate about that issue, housing is their thing. Housing is the center of their perspective on these issues. It still overlaps with all the things we want to talk about at health, but just that subtle thing of moving health and environment to one of the things around housing instead of the thing that housing is around changes the conversation and the mindset for collaboration. And this came very specifically from some of this work where once we showed this figure, the housing people immediately saw themselves in the work more clearly and the public health people had a real aha of like, oh, health doesn't have to be at the center of the diagrams that illustrate these frameworks and all this type of stuff. So again, thinking about what are these small changes you can make that can precipitate mindset shifts to lead to collaborative relationships. And that's what we did here in this timeline. We spent a few years doing specific health impact assessments on housing issues, first in Texas, and then we did one in Georgia on a specific policy and really got in the weeds of that and worked with our state uh, housing finance authority to do that. Then we were able to secure funding to do a follow-up that took that state level finding, those state level findings and recommendations, and then looked specifically how they rolled out at specific affordable housing development sites around the state. And that got us in the conversation with affordable housing developers in an actionable way. It gave us a thing to collaborate and help them make their projects better and more healthy. Not that they don't need to do the project, but you're already getting this funding. How can we shift the policy to make you make it a little, a little better for health or a lot better for health over time. Um, so with that and with the trust built through those relationships and that engagement, around 2017, we started to see this shift in mindset of broadly the affordable housing development community and policymakers in the state. And one of our, our leaders from that side really said, said it clearly, you know, I used to, and he was a, um, is still an affordable housing developer and he said, I used to think of this always as, you know, as bricks and sticks. What we do is we build housing. The policy tells us where to build and how to build, and we build and we do things, and then we move on. But from engaging with us about how to think about how that affects health, how health affects where housing can go, all the different ways you can think more broadly about housing shifted his mindset, and this is reflected in other you know, data we collected from our stakeholders, of housing as a platform for population health. And again, just thinking about what they're doing as this platform for health and well-being opened this, some of the skeptical stakeholders' eyes to, oh, if we maybe do offer the opportunity for on-site um, health screeners to come out and do things every few months at our properties, that could help promote health among our residents. And to them, healthier residents or healthier tenants that pay their bills on time, they have less evictions because of that. So that's their mindset of why it's important to have healthy residents. That might not be exactly the way public health thinks about the reason to have healthy residents, but it gets them thinking in that space in a way, again, with those perspectives on the same issue coming together to think of different ways. So that sort of mindset shift really led us into this opportunity to get additional funding from philanthropy. We also made some policy changes that created a space where developers were actually paying us through an intermediary to do consulting for them on housing applications. So we really got deep in this system and started to expand and do broader work, working with public housing authorities across the state, engaging the um, systems of partners in those local communities, the developers, um, doing other follow-up actions. And, it, and Julia also mentioned the um, sort of the time it takes. And you sort of, if you lead with community engagement, that is valuable. And that can get you to a certain level. But what we identified early on is, well, if we're working at the state level of this and we're bringing ourselves into the state affordable housing development space area, that the way that system already works, the developers run that policy. They have their meetings. The developers basically get to write that policy each year for how the state disperses tax credits to incentivize development. And that's really wonky. And there's not an existing space for community members with lived experience to come into that and provide useful information or have the capacity to even engage in these topics. And so we saw that very early on and acknowledged that as a shortcoming of our early HIAs that the, the equity dimension was really brought in by proxy through agencies that advocate for residents and some of those, so it wasn't completely absent, but we didn't have that lived experience perspective. It took this whole journey to get us to a point now where we have the trust of the state agency, we have the trust with the developers from the information we've given and shared with them on their applications, and we have the trust of the local housing authorities that we really are bringing something worth 
talking to their residents about and getting the residents in the room to tell us about their lived experience in these units. And one more point here and I'll move on. There's a big capacity building component of this project as well where we're bringing these people together in a, and again, simple wording. I think we originally called it a healthy housing learning academy for the, all the stakeholders to be involved in, including residents. And then learn really quickly, what if we call it housing and health learning academy? Again, putting housing first because that's the group we're trying to get to do things differently. And that shift, again, brought more people into these meetings and had great conversations. We had data. So this is skimming the surface of this project. But basically, we created a space that did not exist before for people from a local public housing authority, sort of like property manager people, resident service managers, resident leaders, the developers, the architects, so the money people, the design people, and the state policy people to actually sit at a table for an entire day and collaborate and look at data and just to see the aha light bulbs go off of the developers hearing that, oh, the way we do noise insulation affects the way I sleep, that affects my mental health, that affects the way I'm able to live my life. And to hear a resident say that and it be reflected in the data we were able to bring and then have that constructive conversation where those perspectives are being shared really led to what we we're hoping over time, and this is again where we're positioning ourselves to hopefully be able to monitor those changes over time, see improvement in health for these residents in these communities across our state, and hopefully creating a model that can be used in other states as well. So that's a broad, broad thing. So these are sort of the tools I guess I'm sharing with you are this iceberg. I encourage you to think this way today if you can. HIA on the right. And then these strategies and just how can you leverage different tools and decision-making um, support offerings to synchronize communications and messaging around an issue. How can you think about coordinating that funding and investment in a way that expands the tent and gets more people involved? You're not relying just on government funds or phil philanthropy. You're relying on both. You're relying on developer fees. That's what we did in some of our um, work there. And then just to end, Again, hoping you're getting all these slides. So lots of resources on systems thinking. I'll say that's how I ended up doing maternal and child health work very unexpectedly now over the last four or five years is through systems thinking for their complex challenges. MCH, maternal and child health, thinks a lot about social determinants. They had not been at the table in early, much early HIA work because that work went through environmental health, went through chronic disease, sometimes went through a policy office or a equity office but it didn't go directly to maternal and child health for the most part. And so there's a big mismatch there and that became an opportunity to work with um, maternal and child health stakeholders through these national centers to build capacity of that workforce to think this way. And so there's these in, intra-public health silos to break down as well as cross-sector silos as we think about bringing these perspectives together. So you'll see that in a lot of these tools if you look at them, they come from a maternal and child health perspective, but they're broadly applicable. Health impact assessment resources galore, ever evolving field. I um, encourage you to check those out. Other decision support tools, um, just to note that they are out there. I have limited expertise in any of these. You got the stuff that I know the most about, but I know um, John and some others are gonna talk, I think, about how they maybe have used some of these or similar tools in their work locally. Um, and then encourage you, all of you, you're here today in a Health and All Policy Summit. You are Health and All Policies practitioners. Join SOFIA, formerly the Society of Practitioners of Health Impact Assessment, we again are sort of rebranding to be, Sophia is now just the name of the network for health and all policies practitioners. And that's a great place to go and learn, get to meet people like, John. well you maybe already know John, I'm gesturing to you because I can barely see you through the lights. Um, John, Julia, that's how we connected to have a conversation about this meeting beforehand. And it's a really informal network, very low cost to join, 50 bucks. And I think we have even some discounted rates for students and others. Um, but that's where we talk about the field and how we get involved in hearing these stories from others and how health and all policies is unfolded across the country um, in a lot of different ways, in a lot of useful ways. And it's just a great network of people to be involved with um, and can energize you for this work if you're getting stuck locally and being frustrated, participating in some of these webinars and hearing what's happening. And um, we had somebody from the, uh, oh gosh, I'm gonna say the wrong one. Um, I believe it's the Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma. Um, come and talk about health and all policies, what they're doing there at the tribal level. And just hearing that gave me energy for the whole next week of like, yes, this is still happening. I can solve the problems I'm working on because I have the support of others out in the country doing this work. So with that, I'm pretty sure I'm over time, but questions or pull me off stage, whatever you want to do.
uh, going back to your, your housing work, <clears throat> you talked about the work that you've been doing with developers and, and the state government. Um, how did that work account for uh, gentrification, absentee landlords, and uh, maintenance practices for existing housing? Um, all those things came up as part of it. And let's see. So gentrification, so the, you know, there's, those are certainly loaded terms and big issues. So one specific aspect we did to hopefully, hopefully help affect that. Yes, sir? Displacement. Um, well, one, with the Georgia Homes for Healthy Futures project, the one we're currently working on, that is re, um, through rental assistance demonstration, RAD conversions. So they're doing environmental sustainability updates to old stock of public housing. And we saw an opportunity in that to expand that environmental health conversation to a broader health conversation with these st stakeholders, building on those relationships we had. And a key piece of that that I, that I wish we had been able to go deeper on, but just the structure of the project sort of made it a little tangential, but was the relocation plans for those residents as they had to move out for, the re for their re units to be remodeled, rehabbed. Um, it was interesting working with the developers and the public housing authorities for where could they have stock in their portfolio to, to give the folks that had to move an opportunity to move to another property, you know, same rent, all those kind of things, but then have you know, first right of choice to come back to their former unit once it was remodeled. And so that's one example of that. There's broader data sets and things we were using at the state level, which unfortunately, because the state public health department has not been very deeply involved in any of this. We are the ones from the public health, our Georgia GHPC, representing a public health perspective. So we're kind of at the subject to the data sets they had, but they had a really great community index of about 22 different index, um, 22 variables that characterized at the census tract level who was, who was most likely to live there and what were some of the key health concerns at a state level. And we were able to get the policymakers on the housing side to integrate that into their, their incentive model that previously was just like high poverty census tract. If it's high poverty, you get extra money to try and build new housing there. This expanded that to, well, what if you actually look at the demographic makeup and not just poverty as the one indicator of need in the communities? And so for a couple years there before that data set expired, they were actually incentivizing housing in a more nuanced way into communities of need in a different way that I is a couple steps from reducing displacement, but is really to me, an example of the kind of thinking that needs to happen and acknowledging sort of the market forces that the developers are dealing with. And it's and that's part of the learning is just hearing how they talk about this. And it's, you know, it's not any one developer, broadly, trying to move these people out and make this a better place and that kind of thing. But it's more, these are the properties we can secure the financing to develop, and this is where they are. And if we're only looking at high poverty tracks as the place to do that, that's gonna have ripple effects through the whole housing system. Once they expand that to look at different type of places, oh, there's more uh, Hispanic seniors with limited English proficiency who are likely to work in manufacturing jobs in this area, that tells you, that tells you more. And that's able to then say, well, here's the type of housing that might work best here, and the state incentives for financing follow from that, again, rather than just, Here's where everybody is impoverished. Let's build affordable housing here. But really looking at that nuanced aspect to decentralize it. And we're starting with some of the, uh, what is it, the affirmatively furthering affordable housing, fair housing ruling and stuff that's coming out. Um, we were just having conversations recently about how can we work to help the housing system in Georgia adapt to that ruling that is aiming to, you know, disperse poverty and not, not over concentrate it and, um, I'm gonna stop there because I will ramble on and not know my details of that. But we're very much in that space, building on those partnerships we've created through this existing work to have those conversations as trusted partners, not coming in as an outsider saying, well, you need to do things differently this way because of this problem. We've already had that conversation, so now we can actually be in that structure with those people. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Hi, James. Uh, Kanika Young. We actually met a month ago on Zoom with your colleagues, Angela and Bill, so it's great to see you in person. Yeah. I appreciate your presentation. And the moving housing to be the center of the systems model was really an aha moment for me because I'm thinking back to you know, my work in health policy and equity and focusing on access to health care. We heard things like your zip code is the main predictor of your life expectancy, and there's this whole movement around housing is health care, and we know that 
proximity to resources is really important. And so I was just like, why didn't I think of that before? So <laughs> thank you for that um, aha moment. But my question is, when you made that shift, did you get pushback from your traditional healthcare stakeholders? And if so, how did you deal with that? Um, not really, because you're, you're asking, thank you for that question. Uh, it's because they weren't super involved in the piece of the work we were doing. And so it was kind of us representing health and recognizing that we're not talking to a health audience, so we need to shift the housing. And then the healthcare partners sort of come around it. So one of the, um, things that grew out of our HIA recommendations, and again, this sort of like being able to track and monitor this stuff is purely because of our relationships and being able to piece together these projects to stay involved with DCA as the state agency I'm talking about, um, the Housing Finance Authority, and like being able to be there with them and talk about those kind of things, that it got a policy where they created this healthy housing initiative where one of the incentives, one of the things that would get them, you know, score them better to get the tax credits was to secure an agreement with a local health provider to come on site and do those screenings or some kind of health programming. And so we were helping them with those parts of the application. And that's where we started to engage with the healthcare community. And what we had created was a real space where if there was that right local partner, and some of our work broadly across our center that works more closely with healthcare policy and those types of entities, we could leverage those relationships to bring those people in at really that ground level but then immediately saw the sort of difference of, well, the housing people, they, they're still sort of bricks and sticks. They built, the, that's what they do well. They don't necessarily provide medical services well, historically. There's a lot of models now where that housing is health, um, health care and co-locating services is a strategy. But if you're thinking about that upstream downstream, that's still, that's midstream. That's certainly upstream from clinical care, but it's still, Potential, and this was the this was the tension we were hearing from them was, why do we have to do this now? We, like that's why they hired us through a third party to come in and like look at the data, tell them what would be work there and who the partners might be, and then secure the letter of intent and all that kind of stuff with them, because they saw it as that's not what housing people do. We're housing developers. We don't necessarily do that. We're good at building things, but the policy space, this sort of meeting meeting the system where it is to move change slowly got us where we went with that, even though from our perspective, we would like them to do more design things and more of that location stuff and that further upstream about how is the housing designed and where is the housing and how does that affect your access to health care and health promoting resources in the community. But they weren't, they weren't that far upstream yet. They weren't able, they, their mindset didn't allow them to get that far. So we met them where they were of, okay, we can be a platform for health. To us, that means a platform for health care. So we'll just, you know, for this and we'll have the, the blood pressure van come from the local pharmacy every few weeks and do tests. And that's not a bad thing, but it's still not getting that highest leverage solution, but it's part of that journey building up to it. So I hope, I hope that kind of answered your question. Hello, thank you for your presentation. My name is Raquel de la Huerga and I work for the Health Equity Bureau at the Public Health Department. Great. And I was interested when you were talking about data as a part of the HIA process. I'm curious to talk about the equity issues that come up with using data as your decision-making tool, and specifically in terms of humanizing data or having data represent the intersectionality or the nuance that exists in our communities that is felt by the community, and on top of that, looking at how data, census data as an example, has misrepresented what is experienced in real life. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what was the question? I would just say yes. Uh, to the all question that. was it's a how challenge. are you approaching equity issues in data and how do you account for the issues that I named yeah. with the data that exists so, in moving forward and making <clears throat> sure that your decisions are equitable and not solely based off of data that can sometimes misrepresent yeah. what is happening? So I'll kind of punt that one and I am not the data wonk on our team. Michelle Marcus is our data guru who can really get down in the weeds of that, but I think broadly, it gets to some of what Julie was talking about of how do you engage the community in conversation and in, in collective interpretation of the data because there's the existing secondary data that you can pull and that you have, and you're right, a lot of that comes from inequitable, unjust structures that have permeated for centuries that lead to the way we classify people and problems, but that's the data we have, and the key is to bring in the people with lived experience to help interpret that, share those stories where, well, that doesn't make sense to me, I'm, I would try to use one, what, uh, what's the census category? Um, 
oh crap, I'm, uh, the one that lumps everybody together that's like Asian Pacific Islander, indigenous, that one. And we had a couple, this was actually from maternal health, child health work the other day that came up and they were just like, these communities are so different. And of course that number so small from the big picture that you like, there's reasons that it's to get, have that category to have enough to say something. But once you're saying that something, you need to take it to each of the components, the, to the people who are making up those groups. And if you're really talking to specifically to an indigenous group, have them, have them interpret that, share their stories about it and see where it aligns and where does it mismatch. And then where it mismatches, really lean on that experience. And to bring that experience into projects, it gets to that sort of funding and compensating people for their time at a reasonable rate. And it's not just a $5 gift card because if I'm getting paid whatever, you know, $50 an hour to be there as an expert and I'm only paying a community member $5 to be there, that immediately perpetuates that inequity. And so how can we create in our budgets and our funding structures for our projects really carving out that space? And that's something we've done at the Policy Center over the last several years. We've really started to systematize that in our own processes of we're looking at data that's not coming directly from the people we're serving. How do we get those people we're serving to be an authentic part of that conversation? And again, that's, it takes time and it's hard to do, but um, just the fact that you're even asking that question in that way tells me that Nashville is in good hands thinking about data from an equity perspective. Yes. yes. Hi, my name is Lauren and I work in the WIC program, so yeah. maternal and child health. But um, one question, I really appreciate your iceberg. I've, heard, I've seen it so many times, but it was kind of an aha moment to think about it again and get reminded about it. When we are looking at some of our events that are so shaped by the mindsets down below, how, do you have any guidance or suggestions or advice on how just not getting frustrated or anything about trying to change those mindsets, especially when a lot of your mindsets are set by big P policy, um, and just anything about mm -hmm. that. I would, one say, just take a deep breath. This is frustrating. This is, this is hard work to do, and you can get burnt out. Um, but then your phrasing there, too. The mindsets are affected by the big P policy. I would see it the other way. There are mindsets that create those big P policy structures and those minds, and especially, you know, think about those different perspectives. That they're, we're so polarized now, and it's so easy for people to essentially, you know, sort of revert to their core mindset and not want that to change. And you can see it as you're thinking about these problems, like this, this thing we keep seeing that these same people are saying is a problem, it stems from this racist mindset, not the race, it's the racist aspect of it, or the systemic injustices, or all these things and figuring out a way to, and um, Frameworks Institute, and I know Robert Wood Johns Foundation has some pretty good resources about how to talk about equity to different audiences and sort of, again, using the things that they care about, what's forming their mindset, trying to, again, build the relationship and, and find the space to have the conversation about mindset. That can be the power of the iceberg is, we're talking about uh, WIC, what's, a, what's an event from WIC? Okay, so, so an event might be the WIC recipients are not satisfied with what they're receiving. Then the behavior would be the people delivering the services aren't talking to them in a culturally appropriate way or it might, you know, sensitive way. That might be the problem. The policy is, or the structure is, how are we training those WIC people on the front line to do things in a different way? And the mindset that can facilitate better training against implicit biases there would be that those exist that this problem is deep-seated in the history of racism and in the history of poverty in our community and being able to ha find the space. And that's the tricky part, I think, is like, where can you create these spaces? HIA, to me, is one really good tool to create that kind of space. But there's plenty of other places and meetings and I hope follow-up conversations, like Julia, Julia said, like, go have coffee with somebody from this meeting that you don't know that's in a different sector and talk about things. But creating that space to then unpack that mindset aspect of it. And something I don't think I mentioned earlier is, um, what's his name? It's conversational capacity is the, the tool, the term we use, but basically this idea of candor and curiosity. 
and there's research out there on collaborative networks and how do you collaborate when there is that tension and it's about asking and understanding the mindset and that might get painful and challenging but being able to not just other that mindset and say that's never going to change and you're you're just a part of the problem but rather okay i'm hearing you say it this way i'm curious why how do you think that why do you think that and again it's easy to sit up here and say that and say like it takes trust but that is the key part is who can you talk to about that aspect and how do you build the trust to have a mindset level conversation and be able to clearly show through the iceberg or other tools that it's this mindset that's really affecting that limits our policy opportunities to change the way WIC services are delivered to actually affect the health and well-being of women, infants, and children, per the name of the program. So I don't know. And, and to acknowledge the frustration. And I think that's a bigger conversation just about, especially in public health, but I think society-wide are just burnout over the last few years and what's happened and the way public health profession has sort of been treated and demonized in a lot of settings, that makes this work even harder to do. And so finding the energy in your peers, finding the energy in these networks to see good examples and uh, aspire to that and you know, take care of yourself first to be able to participate authentically in these types of conversations. And that, that takes time and resources and an investment in yourself to be able to not, you know, not you, everybody, to not get like overly frustrated by this, but own the frustration. Know that it's frustrating because it's a complex challenge. It is a wicked problem. And you need to take care of yourself to be able to, again, authentically come into those conversations. I don't know, I feel like I'm talking like a self-help person now, so I don't know if that's helpful or not. Anybody else? Is that it? Any other questions? Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. As a clinical psychologist, I can validate that your advice was also uh, clinically sound. So <laughs> very, very well done.